Good morning, church. If you love the Lord, just give him some praise today. Isn't he good? He's good. Hopefully you are having a great weekend so far. Before we get into the word, I'm going to announce it later in announcements too, but uh, Collide Conference is coming up for the youth students, and today at Ben Garen, it's our family day, so at 1230, uh, we want to encourage you to come hang out with us at the park. While we are there, the youth is going to be having a lunch fundraiser. We're going to be selling uh, some hot dogs, chips, and a drink to raise money for Collide Conference. And so come on out, bring the family. You know, if you want to have a, a nice, it's going to be a donation base. So, uh, yeah, we're just looking for donations for Collide Conference. What a life-changing weekend in the life of our students. We come back each and every year from Collide Conference. Students on fire for the Lord, students who feel called by God to go into ministry, and students who are taking that next step in water baptism and whatever that looks like in their life, living on a mission. And so we are pumped up for Collide Conference. And a shameless plug, if you're 6th through 12th grade, sign up. We want to bring you to Collide, all right? So amen. We're going to get started. So today we're continuing our series, Kings, Queens, and Prophets. Have you all been enjoying it? Yeah. Amen. It's been a great summer. And as we continue today, we're going to be talking about uh, the times in our life when there is pressure, the pressure of fitting in, uh, when you're faced with bad influence, and overall, whenever you are faced with the challenge of, well, everyone else is doing it, why can't I? All right, that's what we're gonna be talking about today, and how as believers, how we respond to these moments that we will be faced with. We will be faced, all of us, with these moments. But before we get started, we're going to pray again. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit into this place to soften our hearts so we can receive this word. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for the, what you accomplished on the cross on our behalf. And Lord, we thank you for this word today. Lord, we thank you that your word does not return void, that your word is living water to our lives. It is the milk and it is the meat and that we can continuously grow in who you are. And Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for all that you're doing in this place. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. In my high school years, like everyone in here, I did some crazy and cringy things, all right? No one's exempt from this. Everyone can think of a moment where you're like, ah, oh, looking back, man, that's kind of cringy that I did that. All right, I had a lot of these, too many to even begin to like list off, but I'm going to give you a couple of them, okay, because I'm nice, all right? I, I like to laugh at myself. If you laugh at yourself first, then when people laugh at you, it hurts a little less, all right? And so we're going to laugh all together at me in a couple of moments, all right? But, but leading off, man, I, I did some crazy things, all right? And every time I would do one of these things, that was cringy, there's a lot of them, all right? or these crazy things, these daredevil moments, it always led off with this statement that someone would always say to me, hey, I bet you won't, all right? And here's the thing. There's some of us in here that whenever you say, hey, I bet you won't do this, you know, they don't know who I am because now I got it. I got something to prove, you know, like that was me years ago. Now that I'm older, all right, not so much. Hey, I bet you won't try to run a 40 in under seven seconds. You're absolutely right. I will tear my hamstring. I'm just going to say I could do it, and then you got to guess all your life. Like, I ain't got nothing to prove to you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm old now. I'm getting older. But when I was younger, all right, man, I felt like I had a lot to prove in my younger days. And so my friends, they knew. They knew if I could just tell Mike, hey, I bet you won't, then he'll do it. And man, that got me into a lot, of, a lot of messes in my life. I remember this one time, true story, all right? This one time, my friends dared me to dye my hair jet black, all right? And here's the thing, I cannot pull off jet black hair. And here's the thing, I'm so nice, I'm gonna let y'all see. So check out this picture. All right, this is me in like eighth grade. All right, yeah, see, I laughed before y'all could ever laugh, so that hurt a lot less, okay? All right, I will say y'all are a lot nicer than the youth are because when I show them these pictures, they take pictures on their phones, all right? Literally, in run-through this morning, I showed this picture, and someone said, ew. And I was like, hey, that, that kind of hurt a little bit, okay? All right, 
But uh, yeah, that, I got dared, and then we had a family picture that you saw. I was in a tree in like 2007, you know? So it was, yeah, there it is again, yeah. So th- crazy moments right there, all right? Crazy moments. But I remember, okay, I'm also afraid of heights. It's crazy. The tallest people will be scared of heights. I don't know how that works out, okay? I do not like heights. I don't like roller coasters. I don't like Ferris wheels. I watch Mighty Joe Young, so I understand what happens on a Ferris wheel when there's this fake massive uh, monkey that can tear down a Ferris wheel. I mean, Ferris wheel. I mean, I just play these over and over in my head. So it's like I'm just gonna stay off these things. But I remember my friend was like, "Hey." Let's go to the carnival. Let's ride some of these rides. I bet you won't do it. And so we rode the zipper like 10 times back to back. That's the thing that you get in the cage. It's like a Ferris wheel and it just spins you up and down. I had a concussion, all right? Like I was, that, I should not have done that. I've tried hot wing challenges. This was actually, I was in my 20s when I did this. I had to sign a waiver. Hey, eat these hot wings. Let's see if you can do it in 25 minutes. I failed and it was awful. And I'm still embarrassed to this day. Now y'all know this about me, all right? I got dared to jump off cliffs. Hey. You know, you got, everyone else is doing it. I can't be the only guy not jumping off this, like, 50-foot cliff, and I am so scared. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, my knees are about to, like, I'm about to fall and pass out. That's how scared I am. But all in the moment, in the words of I bet you won't, when I was 15, you bet I will. You know what I'm saying? I just had to do it to prove something to you. And I'd go home and I'd tell my mom, mom, hey, what did you do today? It was summer. Summer was different back in the day. Most of y'all know before cell phones, you had to ride your bike. You had to make sure that you were home before the street lights came on. You know, you didn't have an Xbox or you didn't have a phone. So you just went fishing. You rode your bike all over town. So when I'd get home and I'd tell my mom, hey, I did this. She, first off, was like, oh, my gosh. Like, your hair is jet black. You know, like, I didn't have to tell her about that one. She just saw me. What happened to you? I don't know. My hair just grew like this, you know? But, like, there were moments where I would tell her, and she would always say this thing. And when I was 15, y'all, it kind of drove me crazy. She would say, but if your friends would jump off of a bridge, would you? Would you do it too? And then sometimes when I was 15, I would think, well, if they said, I bet you won't, probably. But then, like, (laughs) reality, probably not. And the older I get in life... Now that I have kids, I begin to understand why my mom at this time said these words to me that I swore I would never say to my own son. See, my son loves wrestling. We've talked about this. He loves the WWE. Yes, we know it is fake, but so are most of the movies that we know and love and watch. So are most of the TV shows that we tune into each and every week and that we binge on Netflix. We get it, but it's entertaining and we bond over wrestling. I got a few pictures to show you his love and they're gonna be on screen. This is Noah. He's a double champ of our house. Um, he, when we wrestle, he makes up his own rules. So like, he'll never lose these belts because even if I like pin them for three, he's like, well, the count's 10 now. So like, I'm going to kick out on that one. And then we got some more. Uh, this is us at an event right here. Like I said, we love wrestling and it brings us together because I've loved it since I was a kid. And we got one more up here on the screen. This is us together. I mean, we love it. it. We bond over wrestling. And if you know my son personally, you will understand that this kid knows his wrestling stuff. He knows what's happening. He knows the songs. I mean, he knows all of it. And I will say there's a little bit of influence, all right? I've influenced him kind of in a way for him to like wrestling. And because of that, he's influenced me to keep watching it. I mean, we love it. With the love of wrestling, with the influence of wrestling, with a five-year-old, he's got to try the moves on someone, right? And listen, we have a daughter named Nora. She's one, all right? Eventually, she will be tougher than Noah, okay? That's what we've already begun to realize. But right now, she's so fragile. She's one. He doesn't understand. He tries to wrestle with her. There's been no broken bones, no tears, all right? Recently, he hasn't been wrestling with her because we've had to tell him, Noah, you're five years old, but you are four feet, two inches, and you weigh like 55 pounds, okay? Like, dude, you are, you're a big guy. You cannot wrestle with your sister. And so we have this massive body pillow. It's like five feet tall. Like it's, it's huge. And he wrestles with that. But Noah, when he gets that itch in his life, 
When he's watching, when he's influenced to do what these wrestlers are doing, he will go to the extreme. He will climb to the top of our couch, and he will do these swanton dives. I mean, like, literally, he will jump off the top of our couch onto tile floor, and I'm like, dude, you're going to break your leg. But in my mind, I'm like, hey, that's awesome. Danielle was scared to death. You know what I'm saying? She's like, this is an ER visit waiting to happen. Little fun fact real quick before we move on. Uh, at the end of the school year, Noah actually brought wrestling to his school. Yes, I'm proud, all right? I'm just kidding. You know, like he'd get a lot of notes. Hey, he's wrestling with other kids. He's like doing pile drivers on them. Like he, he's making them cry. They're like all but fighting. And I'm like, that's one of those moments as a parent where like deep down, I'm like, that's my boy. All right, but outwardly, I could be like, son, you know what's going on? Like, you can't do that here. And so when that happens, when notes got sent home, Wrestling goes away a little bit, all right? And I'm sad. Noah's sad. Everyone but Danielle is sad when wrestling gets taken away in our home because she's not a fan yet, but Noah and I are working on it. See, influence in our lives, whether it's good or whether it's bad, it is obvious in our lives. You can think back to many stories in your lives where maybe you have been influenced. See, all of us here today, are here because of influence. See, maybe you were invited by someone to come to church. Maybe you were encouraged by someone, hey, join a life group. This will help you. So maybe you're walking in faith right now. Man, you feel strong because of influence. And because of that, man, now you're able to pass that influence along as well. See, when it comes to influence, this is what studies show. Studies show that in your lifetime, you influence 80,000 people in your life. That's a massive number. When I read this, I thought to myself, I don't even know 80,000 people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I only got like four Facebook friends, you know, like 80,000 people is who I'm going to influence. But this is a total number across your whole life, your workplace, wherever it may be. And because of that, this is a message for all of us. Maybe today you think, I don't have a lot of influence in my life. Yes, you do. Maybe today you know, man, I have a lot of influence. Well, this is a word for you as well. No matter where you are, this is a message for you because all of us have influence. In our work, at our schools, in your hobbies, no matter where. Even when you're at the store buying groceries, there's always someone watching. Every one of us have influence. And in the Bible, one of the most impactful stories on how to handle bad influence, how to handle peer pressure, how to handle the thought of, man, everyone else around me is doing this, comes out of Daniel chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and King Nebuchadnezzar. See, these three, they're faced with this. They're faced with bad influence, with King Nebuchadnezzar's command, and they're faced with Man, but look, everyone else is doing it, but this is how they respond. But to give you context on who King Nebuchadnezzar is, King Nebuchadnezzar was considered the greatest king in the Babylonian empire. He was considered a brutal yet powerful king. In Daniel 2, he's trying to get these people to interpret this dream. They can't, so he orders them to be killed. And so we know that he's a powerful, brutal, prideful king that uses all of his power with him. So this is where we pick up at Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, the officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue that he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then the herald shouted out, people of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. And anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. And I want us to stop here for a second. I want us to stop here, and I want us to focus on who King Nebuchadnezzar started with. I mean, it's written so clearly in Scripture, but a lot of times I miss it. Who did he start with? Not just any person. He started with the ones in charge. King Nebuchadnezzar started with those who held influence. 
He started with the high officers. He started with the officials and the governors. He started with the advisors and the treasurers and the judges and the magistrates. Why? Because King Nebuchadnezzar understood the power of influence. He understood that if he could get the ones of influence to bow down, that everyone else, it'll be easier for them to do it. If I start with those who hold influence in many people's lives, then those who they have influence over, man, maybe I could even rule the whole area I'm in. He knew the power of influence. And real quick, I just want to talk to the men of the house real quick. See, this is why the enemy likes to attack the head of the households. It's because the enemy understands influence. The enemy understands if I can start with the fathers, if I can start with the husbands, if I can get them to start turning their backs and to start agreeing with things of this world, then the families, man, that'll be easier. That's why in life, as a father, as a man, as a husband, anyone of influence, not just the men of the house, but the ladies too, that's why influence is so important in our lives. This is why we have to protect it. We have to guard our hearts and our minds because the enemy wants to do everything he can to ruin the influence that you have. Because when we, have, when we live a good Christ-like influence, are we seen? No, God is. And the enemy does not want Christ to be seen by how you love other people. So he wants to ruin the influence. Man, we got to protect our hearts. Amen? Amen. So we see King Nebuchadnezzar. He makes this command. It's backed up by a powerful threat. He said, hey, if you want to bow down, you're going to the furnace. Verse 7, so at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, they bowed to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 12, but there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon, and they pay no attention to you. This is the report he gets back. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue that you have set up. So here's what we see. We see these three. They, they do something when they're faced with negative influence. They do something when they're faced with, man, everybody else around me is doing this. But yet, what do they do? And this is point number one. And it's something that we can apply to our lives whenever bad fluence is around us, whenever, we, whenever culture starts settling for things that we know that as a believer, we shouldn't settle or be okay with this. So what do we do when these moments happen? And it's this, we're called to stand up and stand out. As a believer, we are called to stand up and stand out. We're called to stand up and stand out. We see here that when everyone around these three was doing something that they knew God didn't want them to do, they didn't settle, and they didn't say, okay, I'll do it. They stood up. And because they stood up, what happens? They stood out. See, as Christians, as believers, we are called to stand up and stand out and to go against the grain of culture. But let me be clear, not in a way that doesn't honor God. I don't want y'all to get twisted of what I'm trying to say. When we stand up and stand out for Christ, it only can honor God. And if it's not honoring God, then it's not of God. And so when we go against the grain of culture in a God-honoring way, man, Christ is seen, amen? And as a believer, we are called to stand up and go against the grain. That when culture says, hey, this is how things are now, you say, ah, that's not what the Bible teaches me. That's not what Christ is showing me. That's not how Jesus loved. Jesus led by the greatest example. So if you're confused on how to love or how to do these things, look to the Bible, look to what he did with his life, and he shows the example. And so in that gray area where you're like, ah, should I love like this? Go look at how Jesus loved people. That's how we love, amen? Amen. The truth is, we aren't meant to blend in with culture, yet we are called to stand out. Paul later on teaches the Ephesians kind of a lesson about this in Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 
Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil scheme. So we know that we're called to stand up. But the practice now is that we got to be strong and put on the armor of Christ. See, we not only need to be strong in the Lord and rooted in him, yet we also have to put on the full armor like scripture teaches us. Every day, this is a choice that we get to make. Every day we wake up, am I going to be rooted in the Lord? Am I going to be strong in him? And if so, if I say yes, man, am I going to put on that armor? That is a choice that we make. Paul is teaching the Ephesians, hey, spiritual warfare is going to happen in your life. And it's the same warfare that we will be faced with too. See, maybe we're not faced with the same type of spiritual warfare Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were faced with. But man, when loss happens in our lives, spiritual attacks happen. When we feel like debt is crippling in our lives, here comes a spiritual attack. Whenever we get a doctor's report, here comes a spiritual attack. So we're faced not only with these physical attacks in our lives and things happen, but yet spiritual warfare does happen. And what does scripture teach is that we got to be strong in the Lord. When this moment happens, we got to be strong in him. We see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't just faced with a physical attack in this moment. They were being faced with a spiritual one as well. Yet because they were strong in the Lord, and yet they put on the full armor. They were able to withstand and go against the grain. How do we start with this? How do we start to go against the grain? What are some, some steps that we can take? Because it looks a lot different now in our lives. See, when the world promotes selfishness, we promote servanthood. What does it look like to go against the grain today? When the world promotes bitterness, we promote forgiveness. When the world promotes self-worship, we promote humility and servanthood to the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. See, these three Hebrew men, surely they knew they'd be seen, right? Like everyone's bowing down and they're just like standing. They're not going to do it. But could you imagine? Could you imagine what our situations would begin to look like if no matter the threat the enemy threw our way? Because they knew the threat of the furnace. They knew what would happen, yet no matter the size of the furnace they were faced with, what happens? They never bended, they never bowed, and they never broke what they believed in. They stood up. The easy thing was for them to bow. How easy is that? Man, everyone else is doing it. Let's just bow real quick. I mean, they're going to kill us. These three, they stuck together. You know what I'm saying? Let's just bow. Like, two seconds, who's going to see? Yet they didn't. Because we know in life, that the easy thing in life isn't always the right thing to do, amen? As a believer, the honest truth is that most of the time, the easy thing isn't the right thing to do. For them, in this moment, the easy thing for them was to bow, yet they stood. So King Nebuchadnezzar finds out about this, and we pick up in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, because now they're face-to-face with King Nebuchadnezzar. He's asking, hey, is this true? I'm going to give you all kind of a second chance. And they say, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God that we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. So we see not only did they stand up and stand out, but they were confident in who their provider was. They're confident who would deliver them out of the enemy's hand. Amen. And in our lives and in our situations, this is a principle that we can add whenever moments of our life feel tense like this. Whenever culture says to do this, whenever peer pressure says to do this, whenever we, who we influence is now leading this type of way, here's what we got to do. Point number two, we must be confident that God is our deliverer. We got to be confident that God is our deliverer. These three, oh, they never compromised. They never bended. They never bowed. Why? They were confident. They knew who their deliverer was. See, when we are confident in who our deliverer is, when we are confident in who our provider is, it will lead us to areas in our faith and in our walk with Christ that we never knew was possible because we were just confident who God was in in our lives. See, if these three weren't confident in that God would deliver them, would they have bowed? 
Probably. If I'm not confident in the moments of my life that God's going to show up and be, be my provider, do I believe that in my walk? No, because I'm not confident in it. But when we're confident in that, man, we know that no matter what valley comes our way, no matter what storms, we're rooted in who Christ Jesus is. So no matter the depths of my valley, no matter the strength of my storm, I know that God will deliver and he will provide for me according to his will, not according to my will, but according to his will. See, we, we see these three, we're so confident that the Lord will provide. And guess what? We know the Lord does. See, there's been areas in my life even where there's, it's been hard for me. There's moments in my life where, man, Lord, I need you to provide. I need you to show up. Can you? Will you? But see, I've seen him do it once before. And when I know he's done it before, I know he's a God that's more than able to do it again. Amen? Amen. See, in my life, when I think about personally, where has the Lord showed up for me? Where has he provided? Where has he delivered? Well, first off, I think he saved me of my sin. He delivered me from my pride. He delivered me from my ego. He delivered me from all the selfishness that I was living in, and he led me to a new life in him. So he delivered me from myself. And a lot of times we think ourselves are so great, but yet when they're not rooted in Christ, man, it's just rooted in things of this world. That Christ does not promote, but he delivered me from that. And when I think, well, how has he provided for me? I think of my babies. I think of Noah and I think of Nora, the sweet handful that I live with. You know, like I think of them and how much I love them. And we see, you know, my babies are here, but it was a journey for us to have them. Because you see two babies, but yet we dealt with loss after loss before we had those babies multiple times of trying to have a baby and it just didn't work time after time after time heartache after heartache after frustration after god why is this happening to us one after the other but yet the lord provided Amen. and even in my own life there's some things that i got some praise prayers about that are unanswered right now there's some things in my life that the lord hasn't really answered it yet but because I know he's provided once before, he could do it again. I know because he's delivered me once before, he could deliver me from the things that I'm dealing with again. Because if he could do it once, he could do it twice. Amen. So I stand in the fact that he is my deliverer. We see these three. We see these three. They stand up for what they believed in. They stood up for what was right. They were confident in who they deliver us. And then this is what they show us. Point number three is that we worship out of obedience, not out of our situations. What do these three show us? Man, right now they're face to face with this situation. I need to bow down and worship this idol or I'm gonna be thrown in the furnace. But they said, no, I'm not gonna worship off my situations. I'm not gonna worship off what I can visibly see, but I'm gonna worship out of the obedience, out of my heart to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. What would that look like in our own lives? If that the storms that we're faced with, that the valleys that we go through didn't dictate the posture of our worship, but yet we knew because of who God is, because of what he's already done, what he's already accomplished on the cross for us, that's enough, amen? Because we know that, hey, I, I don't need to be in a place in my life where I worship only when things in life feel good. Whenever I got that bonus on my paycheck, whenever my kids aren't acting up, whenever my friends or my football team or my sports team's doing good, but yet I need to worship because I'm being obedient to what God's called me to do. I'm, being, I'm worshiping out of gratitude in my heart for who he is with thanksgiving on my lips and coming out of my mouth when I sing praises to him for what he accomplished on the cross when I didn't deserve it, when I couldn't earn it, yet because I worship out of obedience, not based off what I'm able to see, not off of my situations, we are able to do this. These three never bowed. They never worshiped this idol when it was easy to, when their situation said to do it, yet they worshiped because they had a deep understanding of who God was in their lives. And they believed this so much, how they respond in verse 17. If we were thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. And I love in this response, it does not stop there. Because, hey, they could have fought back with that. Say, so, hey, we are confident the Lord will deliver us from this. 
But here's what we see. They didn't. Because sometimes in our lives, God's will looks different than our will. See, a lot of times the will that we have for us is short-sighted. But God's will is perfect and complete. And so this is how they respond, knowing that God's will is greater than their own will. But even if he does not, even if he doesn't, even if I'm not saved from this furnace, we want you to know that we will not serve your gods. We will not worship the image of gold that you have set up. But even if he doesn't, how easy in this moment for these three to say, hey, everyone else is doing it. Just bend down real quick. Let's just say we're tying our sandals back up, kicking the dust off our feet. You know, no one's going to see. But in the face of peer pressure, in the face of negative influence, in the face where everyone else is doing it, everyone else is okay with it, they never did it. They didn't bow because their worship was not determined off of that situation. Their worship was based on who God is. In our own lives, this is how worship should be. When the doctor's report isn't that good, I'm gonna worship because I know that he is my healer and he is my provider. Whenever we feel the weight of the world on our shoulders, we know that the Lord is our deliverer. And we know that we can lean on him and lean in his peace that surpasses all my understanding. We can lean on these things and we're able to worship through these moments in our lives when life is hard because we're confident in who he is because we're not focused and fixated on this big mess that the enemy's trying to distract us with. What we're focused on is how big the cross of Jesus Christ is, amen? And in that moment, when we lean in on him, man, that changes our situations. And here's the thing. I love what David says in Psalm 7. He says, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I want y'all to underline that part. I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. David's saying, hey, I'm giving thanks to the Lord not because of my own understanding, not because of my own merit, not because of my own doing, but because of his righteousness. I give thanks. See, even if things don't go the way we had hoped in life, maybe that prayer that we're praying goes unanswered and we don't understand it. We still gotta be rooted in who he is. We gotta be rooted and we gotta trust that he is sovereign. He is my provider. My will was for this to happen, but yet it didn't happen the way I had hoped. And in those moments, more than ever, we got to trust that his will is perfect and complete in our lives. In the moments when our heart hurts because that prayer that we prayed wasn't answered and maybe what we had hoped for didn't come to pass the way we had hoped for it, when it's hard to kind of sway, Lord, where are you? When you're faced with the pressure of culture saying, hey, it's okay to agree with these things that Christ would never agree with, that we're not called as believers to agree with, but hey, everyone else is doing it. Whenever we're faced in these moments in life that are difficult and hard, we gotta trust in him. We gotta simply trust in who he is. And we see this in the life of Paul. Paul pleaded with God time, three times, Lord, take this thorn out of my side. Please remove it. Pray. I would say Paul was probably a spiritual person, right? You know, like he, he wrote a lot of letters. He did a lot of amazing things. Paul knew how to pray. Yet was his prayer not effective? No. God's will for this situation was greater than what Paul could ever understand when that thorn wasn't removed. Because Paul came out with a greater understanding. And we see this in 2 Corinthians. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. 
For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Even when our situations don't declare it, church, we have everything in Christ Jesus. Amen. When our situations and our circumstances try to tell us we have nothing and that we lack and that we're not complete, we know through Christ we lack nothing. Through Christ we are complete only because of him, only because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, not because of anything we can do, but because he is perfect in my weakness. And that's got to be enough for us, amen? That's got to be enough for us. So how do we respond like these three did in Daniel? Face with peer pressure, face with everyone else is doing, because we live in a culture where, man, there's just too many believers that give into things because everyone else is doing it. Everyone else is okay with it. But I know for a fact, God has called us to not give into those things. He's called us to be strong and rooted in who he is. In the face of those lies, hey, it's okay, everyone else is doing it. In the face of bad influence, if we don't bend, if we stand up, if we stand out, if we worship out of a place of gratitude and obedience in our heart, not based on our situations, if we believe and we're confident in who our provider and our deliverer is, it will lead us to areas in Christ that we never knew were possible. And in the moments when we're faced with those hard moments, man, we just trust on him just a little bit and fully trust on him even. He will be there for us. And even if things don't go the way you'd hoped, his will for your life and for my life is perfect. And we got to trust in that. Amen, church.